So Brushy Fork Leadership Institute, for those who aren't familiar, is a department at Berea College. We're a strategic initiative of Berea College. And we've been in service to the Central Appalachian region for the last 30 years, working on various programming oriented toward leadership development. Um, and so we have a few like key program areas. One is our annual Brushy Fork Leadership Summit, where we bring nonprofit leaders from all around the region together for two or three days of intensive workshops around nonprofit development and leadership work. And then our other main program area is our community leadership program. And so this community leadership program has had many iterations over the decades, and we are in our latest rendition of it, which is called the People Ready Communities Leadership Program, which is what brings us all here today. We've got a little PowerPoint ready to go, and I probably won't stick to this super thoroughly, but it'll at least be a little guide. <laughs> um, and so I wanted to share this uh, flyer, which some of you all might have already seen, just um, giving a little more context on what it means to be people ready. And so um, <clears throat> like I just shared, this, this people ready concept is really about answering questions around how can we enhance quality of life for, for all and doing so in the name of economic development. And it's the idea that economic development traditionally has been measured based on jobs and numbers and these sorts of metrics, but that's not the whole story. We need to really look at what makes a community a place where someone wants to, to live, to come back to, to move to. And then that's what will create robust small businesses and attract industry and improve economic development for for a community. And so we are working in three counties in eastern Kentucky right now with this cycle in Knox, Whitley, and Letcher. And so we are still looking for, I think, three or four people on each of those teams. So we do have some slots left. Teams are getting full, which is exciting. And so this concept was really born out of um, us really becoming more, you know, observing and noticing the ongoing trends around um, our rural communities losing population. And I'm sure that you all have been able to see those trends happening in real time in your own communities. But this is happening nationally. There's been a decade long rural population loss. Um, and of course, these numbers come from pre-COVID. So I do think that some of that changed in COVID when folks did start moving back to to rural places. And I know a lot of our Eastern Kentucky communities did see a little boost in that. Um, and those trends are gonna keep happening. People wanna be closer to nature. They wanna be out of the hustle and bustle and more people have remote jobs. Um, so of course we are rural. This is just a little map of our, our little areas. We see London and Corbin there on the map, um, which are, of course, higher concentrations of rural populations. But as you all know firsthand, um, not very densely populated throughout the county. So these trends are certainly alive and well in, in our areas. And Knox, Whitley, and Knox in particular has lost 5% of the population between 2010 and 2020. Um, and again, those trends are continuing, although we don't have the next census data yet. So when we talk about being people ready, we are also specifically talking about how do we how do we make our communities more welcoming and inclusive of diversity? And it's a little bit of a fallacy that Eastern Kentucky is not diverse. That's that's not true. Um, while we may not be on the same um, diversity statistics as national numbers, um, Eastern Kentucky certainly does have diverse population. Um, and so the, really the big picture, as, as Leah alluded to, is that um, despite uh, rural populations in, in Eastern Kentucky, uh, the, those populations not being quite as diverse um, as the national statistics, there is diversity within um, the population. And so um, there has been growth among the African-American population, the Hispanic and Latino population, as well as the Asian population over uh, the last 10 year census uh, period from 2010 to 2020. Um, and nationally, 3.8 million 
uh, queer people live in rural communities and in Kentucky, that is about 3.4% of the population. And so people of diverse backgrounds do exist in rural America and they exist in Eastern Kentucky too. And as a part of this program, that's those are the kinds of folks that we want to participate and bring into the conversation as well. Rural places can take action to support our current community members, bring back those who have had to leave, and attract prospective residents. That's what being a people-ready community is all about. So we've been talking about this a bit. If our overall desired result is to provide quality of life that stops population loss and rebuilds our economies, how can we do it? We've had the idea around improving broadband access, but what are your what are some other thoughts of what do, what do we do about this? So another part of being people ready is thinking about the narrative that we have been really painted with in Appalachia and particularly in Eastern Kentucky, which is that narrative around poverty and grit and just all of the stories that get told about who other people think we are. And part of being people ready is is really reclaiming that narrative and Helping, helping to shift the narrative that Appalachia and Eastern Kentucky are beautiful places with rich cultural traditions and so much to offer. So through the program, we will do some work around what is the narrative we want to see portrayed to the outside world? And then how do we want to live that? How do we want to create a vision around that narrative? So this slide is just some some headlines about rural America in general, which we won't we won't belabor. You know, we all are probably pretty familiar with the perceptions. And to tie into that narrative piece of this people ready concept itself was inspired by a conversation with Haley McCoy, who's the president and CEO of the Kentucky Association for Economic Development. And Haley was in a meeting with a Korean EV battery supplier. Um, like a big factory that was trying to come to Elizabethtown. And in those conversations, there were a lot of questions about the Korean population that would be coming in as a result of this industry and what quality of life would be like for those folks coming into the community. And Elizabethtown was not prepared to answer those questions. And despite the fact that Elizabethtown actually has one of the largest Korean populations in the state, there were no there was no representation of Korean people in the room and nobody was able to answer those questions. So it became clear to Haley McCoy that there was a lot of disconnect about who who is in our communities and what services, what activities, what opportunities are available to them and what is quality of life like. And so we have the opportunity to craft a narrative that says we want a diverse work workforce to come and we are ready for them. So again, just tying to that narrative piece of we have to craft the narrative in order to create the vision. We, we've touched on this a bit, but what kind of people or who are we trying to attract or integrate into the workforce that, that is, is not already participating or not at the levels that we would like to see? So our own college graduates. So for folks like Leah and myself who went away to work or went away for college and came back, can we get those folks to come back to the community and serve in some capacity? Remote workers, especially after the pandemic, we've seen not necessarily an influx, but that kind of population shift towards rural areas and executive workforce and industries. So attracting industries. And so how do we, how do we foster a community and an environment that's economically viable? Immigrants. Uh, so continuing with those population trends, how do we attract folks of diverse backgrounds based on ethnicity and race, people in recovery and who are ready to re-enter the workforce. So really tapping into that population as, as a viable contributor to people-ready communities, uh, tourists as well, and then lastly, climate refugees. And so lots of folks recently in the last several years have, we've witnessed, have been relocating from places like California, Oregon, the West Coast, and elsewhere to places like Appalachia, places like Eastern Kentucky as an affordable and safe place to relocate and live. And the People Ready community can also support aging residents and retirees. We know that this is a huge barrier or obstacle in Eastern Kentucky is 
the accessibility of medical services, especially for aging residents. So just naming, not, not trying to just point out where we aren't doing things right, but where we have opportunity for growth. And then also, like I mentioned before, focus on our youngest communities. No generation can be left out, as this quote names. So what happens when we have a diverse base of people in our communities? We have new businesses, we have more spending power, we have improved work skills and education levels, we have more professional connections, leadership skills, volunteer capacity, more children, we have an increased tax base. And overall, we have a more robust economy and a higher quality of life in our community when there are more folks available to participate and contribute. And this can really result in things like revitalized downtowns, moving from brain drain to brain gain, more resources for schools and infrastructures, and more people who understand rural communities. So there are people choosing to move to your town for what you are today and what you will be, not what you were. So this just allows us to take a step back and be visionary and not, not focus on just, again, the things we don't have or where we've been, but what is the trajectory forward and how do we want to shape the narrative and move the vision forward? But what are people seeking when they come to our places? A simpler life. You know, we all love the peace and quiet of living rural. Safety and security, less traffic, lower cost of living, outdoor recreation, quality schools, be closer to family good internet, and generally just more space and seeking robust culture. So obviously our communities have a lot of these things and there's a lot of room for growth on these as well. So these are some food for thought questions. Would you or your community be able to answer these questions? So in that same vein that Haley McCoy was in the room with the Korean EV company, these are some, some questions we hear that industries are looking for answers to, or people moving into communities are lo looking for answers to. So could you answer questions from a remote worker about quality of life for raising kids in your community? Could you direct an immigrant family who are English language learners to resources that might help them be successful with the small business they are opening? Could you answer some a big industry like Ford Motor Company's questions about your com community's equity and inclusion plan for a diverse workforce? Could you tell an elderly couple how well your community supports aging in place? Would you be able to direct a local family to workforce resources for their daughter who is in recovery and wants to go back to work? So these questions are really just some that we hope to help our teams through this program be able to answer with a little more confidence, both through some assessment that we'll do near the beginning of the program and then through the project work and really like coalition and network building on the team is how can we how can we just be more prepared to know what's going on in our communities and how to answer these kinds of questions so each team will get a five thousand dollar stipend which you know only goes so far and we acknowledge that last year we, we did a thousand dollars and that was very obviously not enough to really have an impact so we're hoping by having increased that amount to five thousand that will at least be a seed and Within the scope of the program, the flow of it really is that there's an opening workshop in Berea for two and a half days in March, on March 20th through 22nd. And there we will dive deep into concepts and knowledge around like community and economic development, around people readiness, some of that assessment I mentioned, some like personal leadership transformation and growth work around identity and equity and belonging and allyship. And then the teams will come together and come up with a project idea. And so the project ideas can really be a wide range. Just to make it clear, the project that each county team decides to work on, it is their decision. And that can be an existing initiative in the county or community, or it can be a new idea that you all collaborate on. And the counties that we're working in are Knox and Whitley and Ledger counties. And so just an example of projects in the past. In Bell County, the team put together a resource guide, and there is a, a broadband connectivity issue in Bell County, as is true for much of the region. And so they did a digital version of the resource guide for social services and other small business directory type information. And so they did that digitally as well as uh, in print because of that broadband connectivity issue. And then they also devised this kind of people ready designation 
which there are certain criteria or markers for a, a business to, to get that designation. But that's what they did in Bell County. Floyd, I believe, did a marketing campaign called Why Floyd? So talking about and focusing on the people-ready concept in Why Floyd County is viable for industry to locate and for folks to relocate to and and even for folks in the community to stay there and be invested in the community. Clay County, they have been working on a mural of the Brown Bombers, which was an all-Black baseball team in the 1950s. After having observed that Manchester's murals exclusively feature white folks, and so they also were working on, or they also viewed their team as like a, a coalition where they could then become the resource and the go-to people when city development or private development or different entities were trying to answer some of those questions we named and maybe need it like a place to consult. So they've been building that out and their project work is still ongoing. So some folks have done these more like beautification oriented projects. Perry County also worked on like a chamber of commerce business directory for minority owned or women owned businesses in Perry County. So the scope of the project can vary a lot. And that's really up to the team. There was also a lot of interest from a couple of the teams last cycle around sort of like developing more of like a certification program to like help small businesses or nonprofits or other organizations in their communities like become certified people ready. I think that's something that has some like power behind it and might continue. And another element about this next year um, so while we provide the $5,000 seedling grant for project work, we've also been in conversation with the folks at USDA Rural Development, and they're really interested in meeting with each of the teams and supporting the teams and getting more oriented towards some of those bigger federal rural development grant opportunities. And so those sorts of opportunities are longer term. So the vision with that would be really like using this six month pro uh, program time to build team cohesion, to build the coalition, to get some work under their belts through this project work, and then sort of let, let, and this is really just up to the teams themselves, but we hope to be able to network folks into opportunities like with USDA Rural Development and others that come our way to help build out a longer term vision for moving money into the community and um, building on the project work. It's bringing the right people together in the room who can then leverage their power and their networks to be able to access and then do the work. So I'm really thinking of this program more and more as like, I keep saying the word coalition, but I keep going back to that of just like, we're, we're building coalitions of people working across sectors to support these themes and concepts of becoming people ready. So just to go over a little more of the details of the program commitment, um, like I said, we have the three-day opening workshop in Berea, March 20th through 22nd. And at that workshop, uh, folks will pick their community project, which that time commitment will vary depending on the scope of the project and what your commitment and capacity within that is. Um, but we do recommend that teams meet for an hour once a month just to keep the the project work going and then whatever additional time commitment might be needed to actually implement the project outside of that. We will have a midterm workshop back in your community. Oh, sorry, let me back up. Before the opening workshop, we'll have an orientation meeting in each county. So we'll come to you all. And um, that will just be an opportunity for some team building and we'll have a meal together and just kind of get to know one another. And then coming into the opening workshop, then the midterm will be back in your county where we'll check in about project progress and that that's kind of like develops as we go. So we can just see where the teams are at and what additional professional development or skills or anything else like that might be supportive at that point. Throughout the program, we will also provide like community coach calls. So I'll be the coach for Whitley County and we're working with David Cook, who's a longtime agriculture consultant in Grow Appalachia director for a long time and anyway he'll be working with Knox County and Colby will be working with Letcher so we will have like we'll have as much capacity to work with folks one-on-one -on -one or as teams as is desired and we'll all come back to Berea on October 18th for just a one-day closing workshop where we'll pretty much focus on sharing about the projects and sort of coming back together to figure out where to go from there. 
the program overview the program is free to participate and all meals and lodging are included at the opening workshop and any other time that we are together at a meal time we will provide a meal and then if folks do need a little support with like travel or child care or anything like that we do have some limited funds available for personal travel stipends and then all of that information is on this flyer which i'll follow up with after the fact the next step is really to apply so if you are interested please do apply i'm colby and i are also available for additional questions and further conversation if you find that you hang up from this call and still have some lingering thoughts and then we also would request that if you know of anyone else in your network who you think would be a good fit, who you'd really love to see on the team, please do share this information. I'm happy to send a follow-up email, follow email that includes language that's easy to share with others, as well as that flyer. And, and then really thinking also about teams so far are really stacked with very established leaders with a lot of experience, which is incredible because I think the the power that can come from folks who are well connected and know how to make things happen is really wonderful. But we do also want to make sure that this opportunity is accessible to more emerging leaders and communities. So if you all also know folks who are maybe new to your staff or maybe young people who are stepping into leadership or people coming out of recovery and back into the workforce who could benefit from um, working in this kind of space, then we'd also really encourage um, emerging leaders to be part of the team. So I think that's about all we have to share, but I would love to answer any questions or have any further conversation that's still alive for you all.